March 8th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Luke chapter 23 from the New Testament. Then the whole group of them rose up and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation, forbidding us to pay the tribute tax to Caesar, and claiming that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? He replied, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they persisted in saying, He incites the people by teaching throughout all Judea. It started in Galilee and ended up here. Now when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was Galilean. When he learned that he was from Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who also happened to be in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some miraculous sign. So Herod questioned him at considerable length. Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priest and the experts in the law were there, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then dressing him in elegant clothes, Herod sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other, for prior to this they had been enemies. Then Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. When I examined him before you, I did not find this man guilty of anything you accused him of doing. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, he has done nothing deserving death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. But they all shouted out together, Take this man away, release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been thrown into prison, for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once again because he wanted to release Jesus, but they kept on shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What wrong has he done? I have found him guilty of no crime deserving death. I will therefore flog him and release him. But they were insistent, demanding with loud shouts that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, who had been thrown in prison for insurrection and murder, but he handed Jesus over to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. They placed the cross on his back and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, among them women who were mourning and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For this is certain. The days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore children, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if such things are done when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other criminals were also led away to be executed with him. So when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Then they threw dice to divide his clothes. The people also stood there watching, but the rulers ridiculed him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourselves. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanging there railed at him, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we rightly so, for we are getting what we deserve for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, 
I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, because the sun's light failed. The temple curtain was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And after he said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breast. And all those who knew Jesus stood at a distance. And the women who had followed him from Galilee saw these things. Now there was a man named Joseph who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He had not consented to their plan and action. He was from the Judean town of Arimathea and was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock where no one had yet been buried. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they returned and prepared aromatic spices and perfumes. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. God, I struggle with the story that is the murder of my Savior. Yet he died to become my Savior. And that is a very over overwhelming thought, one too big to grasp in an entire lifetime. I've been reading so much of the Old Testament and the sacrifices that were done back then for their sins and the animals and the blood. And here you sent your only son, the perfect first son, unblemished, to be the ultimate blood sacrifice for all our sins. And yet we continue to sin so casually, forgetting this incredible sacrifice that you, his father, and he, your devoted son, did for us. Maybe we just don't get completely everything that happened up on that cross for us. You know, I grew up as, as a young child in church. I never had a moment in my life where I didn't understand heaven and hell. I was taught to be very young. But can you imagine if you lived a life of no hope? That when you died, that was it? That was all? So when, when Christ was murdered up on that cross... He actually saved us from two things, from ourselves and our sins, as well as from a life of hopelessness. He saved us from death being the final point of our life. And it's just amazing to me, God, that in his final moments, his final hours here on this earth, His thoughts were so devoted to you. When the pain must have been unbearable, something that I will probably never experience. And yet he still was filled with intention and focus on you and compassion for other people when he comforted the women in the street who were, who were mourning him. And when he asked you to forgive the people because they didn't know what they were doing. And when he offered salvation to the other man hanging on a cross as forgiveness for his sins. You 
even in the worst pain of his entire life here on, on earth, Jesus still remembered who he was and who you were. God, as we go through today, I ask that we remember what that sacrifice has meant for us. That we have hope, that we have life, and we have forgiveness. We serve a God of compassion, of grace, of mercy. Who loves us in a way that we will never, ever deserve. Ever. God, I don't want your son's murder to be in vain. I don't want him to have had to go through the pain for the forgiveness of every single sin that has ever happened and ever will happen in this world for me to take my life today so casually and for to take his death so casually and for to take your mercy so casually. God, today, <laughs> I just want us to overflow with compassion for others, with mercy for others, with grace for others. The death of your son deserves for us to glorify you here on earth in that way. I say thank you for everything that you have done for me, but in all honesty, I will never fully grasp everything that you have done for me, but at least help me find a life where I glorify you, where I can reflect the love that you have for me to others in this world. In your son's name we pray. Amen.